Hello, good morning everyone, FAA members, and to all the guests. It is my pleasure to be with you again. However, please accept my apology for not being physically available at the venue today. In this presentation, we will discuss about the damages for delays to completion. Being a planner, the main concern is always the completion of the project as scheduled. However, as we all know, that when there is a delay in the completion of a construction contract for events that are attributable to the contractor, then the contractor may need to pay for damages for breach of contract. So the damages are meant to place the innocent party in the same position as if the contract had been performed without the breach. The topics of this presentation will cover the different forms of damages. Uh, we will have a demonstration on how to succeed in the submission of claim for damages. We will also go through with the methods of calculation of damages as well as its application. And uh, we will also review some common issues relating to damages for delays to completion. Generally, damages has two forms and these are unliquidated damages and liquidated damages. So we will discuss in detail the differences of these two in the next slides. The first is unliquidated damages. These damages are based on the actual loss of the employer and uh, these are needed to be proven at the time of loss. Um, it is not necessary, however, to agree the level of damages at the beginning or uh, during the signing of the contract. And uh, there is no value entered in the contract. The disadvantage of unliquidated damages is the amount can be subjected to lengthy discussions and calculations that may not result to agreement of both parties. The contractors and employers, of course, are expected to have different certainties. Liquidated damages are predefined sum, which are to be payable in the event of delay beyond the completion date. And these are recoverable without the need for proof of the loss. So liquidated damages are an amount of money that are agreed upon by the parties at the time of the contract signing. So the agreed amount uh, usually establishes the damages that are that, uh, that can be recovered in the event a party breaches the contract. So this amount is supposed to reflect the best estimate of the future damages at the time of the contract signing. So normally, uh, the estimated amount for liquidated damages are deducted irrespective of the actual amount of loss resulting from the delay. So most contracts um, contain clauses for the deduction of liquidated damages. This allows the contractor to be aware of their liability if uh, the contractor becomes late and therefore um, allows the contractor to consider for the risk of delay in the pricing of their, uh, of their tender during the tender period. So now that we have already know the differences between liquidated and unliquidated damages, the next question is how to succeed in a claim for damages. Um, according to the principles of the law of contract, to succeed in a claim, the claimant would need to demonstrate the following. First, the breach of contract caused losses in the amount claimed. Second, the loss was not too remote at the time of formation of the contract and the claimant took reasonable steps to mitigate the loss. So in the next slides, we will discuss all these three in more detail. As we mentioned in the previous slide, according to the principles of the law of contract, to succeed in the claim, 
the claimant would need to demonstrate first that the breach of contract caused the losses in the amount claimed. So in English law, the purpose of an award of damages for breach of contract is to compensate the injured party for the loss rather than to punish the wrongdoer. That is why we do not refer the liquidated damages as penalty. The general rule is that damages should place the claimant in the same position as if the contract had been performed without the breach, so far as the monetary award can do this. Second is the claimant would need to demonstrate that the loss was not too remote at the time of formation of the contract. So what does not too remote means? The term remoteness refers to the legal test of causation, which is used when determining the types of loss caused by a breach of contract, which may be compensated by an award of damages. So when can damages be said to be too remote? In deciding whether the claimed damages are too remote, the test is whether the damage is such that it must have been considered by the parties as a possible result of the breach. So if it was considered by the parties, then it cannot be considered as too remote. Um, a claim for the damages can only succeed if the damage is not too remote. So you have to remember that uh, the damage which is too remote is not recoverable, even if there is a clear causation between the breach of contract and the loss. And the third, the claimant must took reasonable steps to mitigate the loss. So there is a requirement for mitigation. It is important to remember that even where causation and remoteness have been established in relation to loss, any recoverable damages can be affected if the claimant has failed to mitigate their loss. So mitigation in law is the principle that a party who has suffered loss from a breach of contract has, uh, has to take reasonable action to minimize the amount of the loss that has been suffered. An injured party um, cannot recover damages for any loss, even if the loss was caused by a breach of contract, which could have been avoided by taking the reasonable steps. So now we will proceed with uh, the method of calculation of damages. Delay damages, for example, for the construction of a hotel can be calculated from the loss of revenue from the rooms and the loss of revenue from other hotel facilities. So as an example, the calculation may consider the occupancy levels of a hotel in operation you may have to know the room charge rates, the income of the restaurants, and uh, the leisure facilities such as uh, gyms, swimming pools, uh, the meeting rooms, and conference bookings. So the calculation must also consider the cost uh, that may be saved as a result of delay such as um, utility consumption cost. So the calculation uh, must also have other cons considerations and cannot be based purely on revenue only. On our next example for the construction of an office project, um, liquidated damages may be calculated on the cost of uh, leasing alternative accommodation, for example, if uh, the occupier of the, the office is the owner, However, if the office building is uh, likely to be leased, the damages could be calculated on the likely lease income, similar to the example for the hotel in the previous slides. So the other items that are needed to be considered in the calculation of damages may include the continuing construction supervision costs and fees, the accommodation cost, 
of course the finance cost if there is a loan for the fund for example and uh, of course this list is not deemed to be exhaustive other damages that may be difficult to calculate includes uh, civil engineering projects and subcontracts um, it is more difficult to calculate damages for civil engineering projects such as uh, roads and uh, sewage treatment facilities um, because it may be difficult to put a value on the loss incurred for example for not having a road upgrade so it may also be difficult for a contractor to calculate the level of damages so to be applied within a subcontract so the delay of the subcontractor will need to be uh, considered if it has an impact on the overall completion of the project um, usually there is a possibility that 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 uh, the damages may become uh, disproportionate to the value of the works that is covered by the subcontract. This is the main reason why some contractors uh, usually prefer to enter into subcontracts with unliquidated damages. So once uh, the late completion has occurred, there are different ways to deal with the deduction for damages, which of course depends on how it is stated in the provisions of your contract documents. In some instances, the application of damages is uh, included within the payment certificates that are issued to the contractor by either the contract administrator, the project manager, or the quantity surveyor of the client. However, other contracts deal with this by issuing a withholding notice from the employer. We must also note that uh, prior to deduction of damages from monies that are due, other notices are uh, issued or required to be issued as per contract requirements. This may include the non-completion certificate. So, what are the consequences of incorrect deduction for damages? There are cases wherein an extension of time is uh, being awarded late in a contract. That is say after the late completion of a section of the works. So if this is, is the case, the level of damages that was deducted must be reassessed at the next valuation of payment application. So a reassessment of damages that was previously deducted is necessary. So depends on the provision contained within uh, the contract, interest may become due on payments that were incorrectly taken. So for example, in NEC contract, interest are applicable if damages that are deducted and subsequently the completion date is revised now let us review some common issues that are related to damages for delays to completion first is challenging the sum levied if the contractor does not consider the level of damages to be reasonable of course, it can challenge the amounts during the tender negotiation, which is uh, a better to challenge at this point than challenging the amounts after the contract has been signed. However, the contractor may still try to challenge the amount of damages to be levied closer to the time that they are to be deducted. At this point, the employer would need to prove that the damages included within the contract were a genuine pre-estimate of the loss at the time that the damage were calculated. The challenge will not be successful if the employer can demonstrate a genuine pre-estimate and the actual cost of damages incurred is irrelevant. However, the employer cannot revisit and increase the level of damage deducted if the actual loss suffered is in fact greater than what was estimated. 
challenges may also um, arise where there is early possession or takeover of part of the work by the employer. Contracts generally allow for this proportion of the value of the work to be considered so that full damages are not deducted. So, for example, um, if the employer took over a part of the works which was uh, considered to be, say, 60% um, in the value of the whole project, so the damages would be reduced by the same percentage in the event that the contractor has been delayed and completed uh, the works at a later date. The second common issue is delay in certification of completion. So as we all know, it is very common that at the end of the project, the date of completion is a subject of some debates. In practice, the date of achieving completion is sometimes agreed and formalized some, af some time after the actual event has occurred. So there may also be a situation where the completion date has not been fixed as an extension of the time entitlements may still be in discussion. So this may result to damages uh, that are being deducted, which shall be recalculated and deducted or refunded as appropriate at the next certificate once the date of completion or extension of time has been agreed. Here are other common issues that are related to delays to completion. So during tender or contract preparation, sometimes there are portions that were unintentionally left blank. So if the relevant uh, section of the contract is left blank, then the unliquidated damages will apply. Therefore, it will be for the employer to collate all records and prove the actual amount of loss. While if nil is inserted in the relevant section of the contract, then the employer will not be entitled to either liquidated or unliquidated damages. When there is no mechanism within the contract to award for an extension to the completion date, the employer cannot benefit if they are responsible for the delay. So the remedy for liquidated damages will only survive if there is a mechanism within the contract for amending the completion date in the event that an employer is the cause of delay. So this concludes my presentation and for the questions that are related to the topic, uh, if I may request the committee to please collate all the questions and send them to me by email in one file if possible and I will try my best to answer all of them. So again, thank you and good luck for the rest of the event. Keep safe everyone.